Welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast by Skiff Meetings, the podcast for curious event professionals embracing the future of business events. My name is Miguel Nevsh, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Skiff Meetings. And in this episode titled, The Need for Belonging, I have the pleasure of speaking with Megan Henschel, Global Events Strategic Solutions Lead at Google. Our conversation revolves around the need for belonging and why creating that is so important for events. We also talk about the newly released new project, a project about neurodiversity in events and general conversation about diversity, equity and inclusion in events and just in general in the workforce. We also cover some of the uh, ins and outs of working at Google and how Google plans their events. I hope you enjoy listening to this podcast and don't forget to check out the other episodes of the podcast on our website or via your favorite podcast service. Hello and welcome to the Event Manager Podcast by Skiff Meetings. My name is Miguel Nevsh. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Skiff Meetings and I'm sitting here in Las Vegas uh, getting ready for IMAX America with with, uh, Google's Global Strategic S- solutions lead. lead. That's it. Megan Henschel from Google. Megan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be with you. It's re- really nice to be recording outdoors. You may hear some noises in the background and that's we're recording this outdoors. So it's a little bit of a different podcast, but I hopefully the, the conversation will flow and you'll enjoy the conversation. So um, Megan would love to um, talk a little bit about your journey into the event world, events world, meetings, all that side of things. Do you remember the first time that you kind of understood the industry or really grasped the industry and then, you know, take us through to today, how that kind of evolved, if you will? Yeah. So I I actually started my corporate career in sales and I was terrible at it. And that's how I, I ended up in events. I basically raised my hand and said like, really bad at selling things, but really great at content development and planning regional sales meetings and all of these things. Um, So that was way back in my early 20s. I think I'm just now really starting to understand the industry, um, all the players, the opportunities, um, the possibilities and potential. Um, But yeah, that's how I ended up in events was I was just really bad at what I was doing at the time and um, sort of loved the tactical work involved in event planning. And what, what were the steps in between and, you know, what kind of roles have you had so far? Could you take us through that? Yeah. So, uh, mostly project based. I was in a business development group, um, at a large financial firm for a really long time. Um, uh, doing a lot of internal event planning, a lot of like executive briefings. Um, and then I moved onto the agency side and spent some time with BCD, Um, planning incentives, leadership and development, but all like very project based work. When I took the job at Google, I don't think I really knew what I was getting myself into. Um, But it is much more of like a overarching global strategic role. So I'm not planning events anymore, which I do miss. Um, But now I'm I'm leading uh, strategy and vision for a global team, which is also really rewarding work. Excellent. Um, I think anybody listening who hears the word Google is always going to be a bit starstruck and uh, would love to get your overview of, of how it works at Google. I mean, obviously, it's a big company. You have campuses all over the world. Do you have any any kind of short way of explaining to us how Google organizes events, you know, like the internal and the external ones? There is no short way, <laughs> but I will, I will give you as much of a Cliff Notes version as I can. So Google is very large enterprise. It is a very complicated ecosystem as it relates to events. My team manages all of the on-campus, like Google built and operated event spaces. We have over 600 of those globally and they range from like small learning and development spaces all the way up to like uh, convention center type spaces. Um, And we do over 100,000 events a year. We operate at massive scale. Um, and we do events that range from internal trainings all the way up to like marketing and customer developer events. There's also an event marketing team and an internal culture focused event team. So we have lots of amazing event enablement partners that we work with and work for. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the short version. Hopefully that's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, we just released a report or are releasing a report about the future of work and how it impacts events. Um, are you seeing any impacts from, I, I know, you know, the future of work is, is a big topic, but this idea that people can work from anywhere or work hybrid, flexible, etc. 
Are you seeing any shifts in the way the teams are structured, the types of events that you're, you're seeing come across on, on your radar that are kind of because of that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, Google's much more distributed than it was three years ago before, you know, the 2020 of things. Um, I think for events specifically, we're seeing um, much more of a need to like segment and provide rationale behind the decisions that we're making. For example, if we're asking Googlers to come on campus for an event, we better have good rationale or justification for why that can only be done through commuting and coming on campus. And so we really are spending a lot of time talking about prioritization um, and, and what can be done or optimized for across different modalities, whether it be fully remote, hybrid, or in-person. People want to understand how they were considered and the decisions that were being made. What do you say really makes uh, a great event? You know, I mean, there's millions of events happening, millions of meetings happening all over the world. I think there's a stereotype of, you know, certain structure, certain format, certain ballroom styles, whatever it is. But, you know, when you really think that an event is that extra bit better, when it goes from good to great, do you have any ideas of how that happens? Or I'm sure your events are great. Like, how do you make those stand out or really achieve their objectives? Um, so we've actually been running a series of this is a this is a, a question that I think about a lot. And we've been running a series of focus groups with the Experience Institute to sort of get some data to put behind this um, across event leaders, but also just various types of attendees. And what we hear most frequently is people. So good people and being able to connect um, and spend time with good people makes a great event. <laughs> That's the, the top response resoundingly. Um, also meaning, so having content that matters and that people can connect with and that is bettering their lives, right? They can walk away being like, that was valuable, that was worth my time, um, is probably the second top um, response. I think um, I actually came into Vegas a little early and went to an event yesterday in the desert called the Rise Festival. And there was this moment where we all lit these lanterns that we had written on, whether it was things you wanted to let go of or things that you wanted to attract right in the coming year and we all lit them and they rose into the desert sky all at the same time and there was such a moment of connection. So I think this idea of togetherness, community, being a part of something bigger than yourself is also such a transcendent way to make a great event. I love those. They don't they don't sound super complicated on their on their own, but I think it's those kind of those things that we should focus on. Do you have any advice for people that want to get better at doing that or or maybe you know sometimes we get so stuck in our daily routines where we just focus on the planning on the logistics on the on the scheduling um do you have any advice for people that are trying to push the boundary a little bit or, or maybe push back and kind of say look let's let's really get this people thing right let's get this connection thing right any ideas on how to do that yeah so um you know, in, in 2021, when we kicked off the Experience Institute, it was because I was in this I was in this place that you were just describing where I was like, I don't know what the hell to do, right? Like, I have no idea how to make informed decisions right now. I don't feel confident in any singular point of view about what we should be doing to prepare ourselves for return to office or the future of work or any of this. And so we brought together a community of people. It was listening. Listen. Listen to your audiences. Listen to what people need. Um, observe where people are recoiling at events, right? And where they're leaning in. And that gives you a lot of really meaningful data that you can work with. Um, if that hadn't been for these communities that we've been building and getting outside of the Google bubble and getting more diverse voices at our design table, I, I think we'd still be really stuck. It's all about listening, observing, um, and, and sort of leaning into instinct based on what you're, what you're seeing are emerging trends. So, would love to get an idea of what the Experience Institute is, and is this something that people can access uh, publicly? And you know, how do they do that, and what can they expect? Because it sounds like you've you've taken a lot of what we've been talking about already and kind of synthesized it into this thing. Um, so it is a it's an internal and external community. Um, if community doesn't even feel like a big enough word for it at this point, but I don't have a better one. Um, that we brought together to answer this question, like what could the future events look like? That has absolutely evolved into what should 
the future of events look like and how can we really drive change for good. It is a fully open format community. So anybody, a lot of our existing community members have been people who've like reached out on LinkedIn and said, what you're doing is cool. How can we get involved? Um, we are always actively seeking new partnerships and new voices and new ideas. Um, so really it's just about reaching out. We don't have an externally facing website yet. Um, but we are working on figuring that out with privacy and legal. So stay tuned. Um, but I'm always posting um, interesting insights or data points or things coming out of our community on my personal LinkedIn. So you can see more there. So stay tuned for, for maybe something more public. And, <laughs> I mean, I hate to say, hey, just connect with Megan on LinkedIn because it just feels like that's going to be oh, a bit messy. I don't mind. <laughs> so I know you're here at IMEX to talk about two very important projects. Um, and maybe I'd like to start with, with diversity, because I know you're doing a session on diversity, uh, and then work towards the, the new project, because I think that's linked, but, but kind of um, a little bit separate. So why diversity? Why is that important to you? And, and what do you, what's, your, what's your key message? So I think, you know, when we started the XI, that's short for Experience Institute community last year, we democratically voted on what we thought were some areas we could explore as a collective that would be the most impactful. And new rules of engagement or new social norms was like at the very top of that list, right? People, people knew things had changed, but we couldn't quantify what people would want, what would resonate with them. And so we start, we did 90 days of what we called like our learning phase. So we did, we broke out into groups and did a deep dive into any insights we could find um, through a lot of different mechanisms and modalities. We started to see really interesting trends around, um, maybe we haven't completely changed fundamentally as human beings, but what we're willing to tolerate certainly has. And, you know, where we're investing our time certainly has. So um, we started to dig a little deeper and we really found um, that representation and inclusion were key drivers for effective design in cultivating belonging. And that is really what people are after. I, I've been saying a lot recently, all roads lead to belonging. And it is a big word and it's very conceptual, but we're, we're trying to build a framework around it because we feel like it's that important. Uh, but you can't have belonging without inclusion. And as we started to sort of look at existing resources, education and enablement, there was a huge gap around neuroinclusion um, for neurodivergent communities. And I have an autistic son and it just the stars aligned and we were on a personal journey as a family figuring out how to advocate for him. And uh, learning that events are always probably going to be challenging for him um, because social environments are new places are traveling is so um so we decided to to build it and so that's what we're launching this week at imax is the new project um but we can't we can't expect people to engage if we're not holding space for them we can't expect people to uh, meet our outcomes as experienced designers if they aren't reflected and represented right it has to be a safe comfortable um welcoming environment before we're going to get anything from them. And so we really feel like it's one of the most vital things we can do as designers. You talked a little bit about this kind of tolerance. Um, it, it sounds like a lot of this would have made sense pre pandemic, right? Like what, what is it that what, obviously there's more kind of energy behind it now, but I guess what I'm thinking is how do we make sure that we don't, just go back, right? Like, how do we make sure that these changes are, are kind of permanent and that they're kind of part of how we do things by default? Uh, working together, it's movements. It's grassroots movements in this industry where we rally around these ideas and make them reality. Um, I think, uh, you know, a couple of the other community members and I have talked about how in this industry, a lot of times we sort of wait on what's going to happen and then we react rather than driving the change we want to see in this industry right we sort of wait for the business drivers to tell us how to respond and i think we're the experts <laughs> we're the event professionals we should be dictating what strategic business value is to our organizations not the other way around and so i think it's 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 us right it's us rallying together and pushing these things forward So one of the things that I think is fascinating is, is how this 
works out in practice, right? You know, I think it makes sense when you when you put a board together, when you when you come up with a group that's working on a certain project, you want to make sure to have representation from all these different groups. But what about situations where you you need to exclude people or, you know, something or an event or some situation where this is only for a particular group? How do you manage that in a way that I guess makes it okay for it to be exclusive is 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 it is it just as simple as sort of explaining the reasons why this has to be exclusive or or is there more to it yeah i think it's transparency and authenticity like uh, we say a lot in in the work we're doing for xi days which is going to be our inaugural event next february in new york for this community like not everything is for everyone but there should be something for everyone right like is you should consider everyone along the journey but not everything is going to feel completely inclusive all the time it's an impossibility and if we try to do that um we're going to burn ourselves out and we're not going to make as much progress right i also want to circle back to your previous question like gen z is not going to allow us to go backwards right like <laughs> the next generation of our industry the next generation of the workforce like they're not having it it's inclusive by any means necessary and they they want to be their authentic selves fully and not not be asked to leave any of their lived experience at the door when they walk into an event or to a workplace right so we we have to to be prepared for that yeah it's, it's funny that that's actually a good point because we, we've been one of the areas that we've covered also in our report is that idea that companies are asking uh, staff to bring their authentic selves to work right so it's, it's a big ask right like be comfortable at work be your authentic self but if you're your authentic self then you also are going to get upset about things that don't align with the way you are and the way you want your work to be right so there's a bit of a do you think workplaces are ready because i think that they're asking for people to be their authentic selves but then if they really are their authentic selves there may be things that don't work so well how do we how do we manage that yeah no i think largely it's performative right now like you know i love i mean google is an, an incredibly inclusive environment and like one of my first weeks at Google, I was walking across the the MP campus in Sunnyvale and I it was like May and someone was in full Christmas pajamas, like walking around campus. And I was like, all right, authentic selves, we're doing this. But I think, you know, the way you dress, dress code is different than like, um, you know, demands around racial equity or, you know, whatever it might be, your personal value system, they're very different things. And I think workplaces largely are not safe environments for everyone right now. We're still throwing around terms like professional and assigning attributes to that when that is not a thing. We're still using words like normal and, and you know, assigning that to human beings. There is no normal, right? So I think there's a lot of work to be done around the language we use and um, how we weaponize that language in the workplace and in professional environments, quote unquote. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of work to do. I'd love you to dig in a bit more about that. I think that the weaponizing is is that's a big word. I mean, what what do you mean by that? And um, I guess do you see any good examples of how we can do that? You know, I don't want to go into you know, is it ever too PC. I, I think sometimes we have we use terms to describe roles and I think there's been a lot of kind of roles that don't make a lot of sense to me because we're we're trying to find these terms to make everything, I guess, neutral. But that doesn't always help either if it sort of confuses things or makes things awkward or anything like that. Like, what do you think would be the best practice to to really try to make this work? Obviously we're learning as we're going, but how do we how do we get on a good path? I mean, that's, that is, that's too big of a question. I like, I don't have an answer to that question. I think we just have to, we have to try, right? I mean, the new project is a great example. Like we, we started leading with some terminology that felt incredibly offensive um, and condescending to certain neurodivergent people. And so, you know, while those conversations were incredibly uncomfortable to have, they, com they absolutely pushed the project in a better, more inclusive direction we can't be afraid to mess up. Hey, I almost said a bad word there. <laughs> we can't be afraid to mess up because that is just going to prevent us from doing anything at all. You know, and I, I do, I do think there's a lot of like cancel culture and, you know, the quote unquote PC police that has made those of us who are a little older in this industry really afraid to try, but we, we can't, we can't, we can't be allies if we're sitting on the bench 
um, and we can't maybe create new language that feels better for you know the future of our industry if we're too afraid to try. So I don't know. That's I'm rambling, but I it's too big of a question. I think we just have to be open. Um, and we have to try a bunch of different things and see what evolves into a better way. Love it. And this is, this is the perfect place to ramble because we're, we're you know, <laughs> we're doing a podcast. It's audio where we're, it's okay to ramble a bit. Um, is that kind of the main outcome so far of the new project or are there other areas that you have guidance for and, and can kind of help people with, with neurodiversity and inclusion? Yeah, so the, the new project is fully focused on neurodiversity and inclusion because we saw that as a gap um, in the industry. Um, I, I think so much of the way we've approached this work could apply to any DEI strategy, though. I think as I was not only just like learning how to advocate for my son, but also starting to dig into this work for the new project, so much of what I found was. Um, you know, academics and psychologists and experts on neurodiversity who actually weren't neurodivergent themselves or who had none of that lived experience. And I was like, well, hell, like if I want to understand how to be a better mom for Otis, I should probably talk to an adult autistic person and see, you know, what they would have wanted, right, as a child. Um, and I think the same applies for this work, right, as we're designing events and experiences. We should be listening to those with lived experience. Um, and it's something I haven't really found much of, and I would love to see more of it. I really want the new project to be a mechanism for amplifying neurodivergent voices, getting neurodivergent speakers at as many events as possible, having them speak on your podcast as opposed to myself, right? Like, I think we need to be, again, listening and observing in order to know how to design in the right ways. Fascinating. I think there's there's a lot to learn there. And uh Having worked with someone, Lisa Jade, who I know also worked on a new project with you, uh, who, who who has this experience, I think it's, I think you can learn a lot from from people that, that have that experience, and it's it's always enriching and not in ways that you kind of expect or comfortable ways, right? I think that's that's part of the experience is is being uncomfortable. So tell me a little about this event in New York. It sounds like there's a there's an unveiling. Uh, I don't know how much you can uh, reveal, but I think it would be interesting to understand what what the plan is. Oh my gosh, I'm happy to give you a little peek behind the curtain. So XI Days is going to be a two and a half day event at one of our newest Google owned and operated event spaces, Pier 57 in New York. And we're bringing together um, the XI community, but also a lot of other event leaders from other organizations and companies. Um, and just like people from completely other domains and disciplines, gaming, art, um, technology, design, you name it, um, for a showcase of what we've learned so far. So we're going to like revisit the journey we've been on for the last year and a half and share some of the key insights and data. We're also going to do a lot of live sandboxing. Um, and so we're building out this museum concept. Um, we're definitely leaning into a lot of what we've been preaching about optionality and um, autonomy and agency. So we will see how that goes. Um, but yeah, we're going to trust the attendees to navigate this journey in ways that make sense for them. Um, and we're also going to be mining for, for insight on where we're headed next in 2023. Um, but yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to share more as we get more of it built out. But it's going to, it's going to be a weird one. I'm super excited about it. And just to be clear, who is the audience of this event? Um, so we have about 60, 40 external people and Googlers. So lots of Googlers that have Google employees who have skin in the events and experiences game or in DNI, um, or in learning and development. And then we have lots of external folks from global agencies, other fortune 250 companies, um, people just that are doing cool stuff in the experiential space that maybe aren't in corporate events, but still delivering awesome experiences to the world. Sounds awesome. I, I think we're, we're going to have to figure out a way to, to get involved. <laughs> um, wanted to just kind of, I guess, zoom out a little bit. Uh, we can talk a lot about diversity and neurodiversity in particular. I think fascinating topics. Um, in terms of the, the bigger industry, we talk a little bit about the future of work, how that changes things. Are you seeing kind of other challenges coming up? in terms of, you know, that are impacting specifically meetings and events, but are there kind of challenges coming up that you're seeing 
anything that you think is going to blindside us that we're kind of like, oh, wait a second, we haven't really expected that, but that might be something we're going to be talking a lot about in the next couple of years? Um, so my answer is probably a fairly loaded one, but I, I feel like you're probably into that, <laughs> knowing you. Um, and I might make some people mad with this one, but I think the biggest challenge in our industry right now is how we're speaking to success and how we're measuring what good or great looks like. Um, I personally believe that ROI is broken. Um, I think that we've evolved so much and we've just talked about all the many ways, right? That how we've traditionally done things is creating friction for our audiences. If people have evolved, why shouldn't how we're measuring what we're delivering to them also evolve? And I think um, it's just, ROI is not it, right? We're actually building out a whole new multidimensional value narrative around what we do with events and experiences for Google. And cost avoidance and revenue are at the very bottom of a list of about 10 strategic business values. There's so much more that we do for the world and for our organizations than just like butts in seats and NPS scores and like driving revenue, right? There's bigger things that we're doing I also think that, you know, undeniably one of the core challenges for our industry right now is talent acquisition and retention. Like we have hemorrhaged so many brilliant, beautiful people as a result of the last couple of years. And I attribute this to the fact that this is hard work, but also it doesn't have as much meaning as it should. And that's because the way that we're measuring success and talking to value metrics doesn't align with people's personal values. So if we're measuring how we make people feel, and that's a success metric, if we're measuring how we're driving change for good with our discipline, that is something people can feel good about. And I think we will attract the next generation of talent. But right now, it's really hard to anchor to that. Um, and it feels like I feel good about saving Google money, but I feel great about the new project. That shit gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, and we need more of that in our industry in order to keep people and to attract people. Love that. I think there's a lot of passion behind that. And that, I think that's, that's exactly what we need. I want to pick a little bit on the ROI point that you made. I think it's an excellent point. Um, I think I, I, I've kind of gone through my whole career thinking a lot about ROI. I haven't necessarily worked that much in that, but I did my, my dissertation 15 years ago was about ROI and I was trying to come up with a secret formula for ROI. And I think it, ultimately comes down to this idea of like, you have to measure it for it to be, you know, like worth something, right? Uh, and I think you make an excellent point that, yeah, it's great to save money or whatever it is, but that's not really gonna get people passionate about it. And I feel like the events and meetings industry has for a long time felt like that was the way to get a seat at the table. And I think what you're saying is, that's not how we get a seat at the table, actually. How we get a seat at the table is by inspiring people. How do we shift that conversation? Because as far as I can tell, the events industry, meetings industry has not really figured out how to calculate ROI and prove ROI. There are ways, but it's, you know, it only works in very limited circumstances. How do we shift that conversation to inspiring people in a way that the sea level gets it? Do you have any ideas on how to get there? Because obviously you're doing great work. Um, how, you know, maybe you could help me inspire some people to, to think that way as well. Yeah. I mean, we have to have, we have to have data, um, right? We have to have some sort of uh, numerical value to these things. But um, the, you know, the value narrative, the story that I just mentioned building out, I mean, that it is resonating with our leaders at Google already. And we, the, <laughs> the, the data that we have today, I'm like using quotation marks, is like very hand wavy. But I think people, leaders understand now the value of things beyond just driving revenue. Um, you know, I have a dream that there's a future where performance is actually gauged on how you make your employees feel and managing their well-being rather than like their output, right? These messages are, are resonating, I think, with leaders. Um, it's just providing the right frameworks to help guide those conversations. And it's something we're working on in Experience Institute. And some of this, I, I really feel strongly about making externally available. Um, so at least at least the, the strategic business values or the experience outcomes as we're re referring to them, 
I want to share with the industry and I want to invite people in. So much of this just is broadening the conversation and inviting people in. We'll never get it right the first time. Every leader is different. Every leader's priorities are different. Every organization is different. But having a starting point and then broadening the conversation to help refine that and overlay nuance based on your individual priorities or your leader's priorities, I think is a great, you know, start. It's going to be a journey. It's going to be a journey. But I, we're going to make Fetch happen. I feel, I feel, <laughs> I feel confident. Love it. I really like the, this topic and I'm glad that we ended up uh, kind of landing on this. Um, in, you mentioned about the talents that, that has escaped. And, you know, one of the things we see a lot is is younger generations, maybe people in college right now, hesitating to get involved in, in events. And, you know, it is a stressful job. There is a lot of logistics involved, at least at a, at a sort of junior level. Um, would be great to get your advice on... You know, how do you inspire or maybe direct advice to them or how you think people, sh you know, we should try to inspire that, that younger generation? Um, so we have a we have a Gen Z council at Google and I love attending the webinars and stuff that they put on because hearing this next generation talk about their priorities and how they see themselves creating change, whether in an organization or as an individual contributor um, is fascinating. Um, I think... I think inviting uh, the next generation in to help us define what the next gen roles are in our industry could be a great way to, to bring them in. Um, I see a future where a community moderation is a dedicated role on an events team or a DNI person with the event and experience design expertise, but completely heads down focused on diversity, equi equity, inclusion, and belonging in design. I think that should be a dedicated role on events teams. Um, I think audience advocacy teams could also be a really interesting future. So as designers, so often we're focused on outcomes. What if there were teams completely focused just on understanding who is showing up and what their priorities are so that we can marry the two together? I think we're going to have to really get creative around roles, responsibilities, and the creative liberties we can take as event professionals in order to attract the next generation. But I see all of these roles being critical to our success. Um, and I, I just think the heart and the passion that Gen Z has, they're going to be, they're going to be perfect to make that happen. Sounds like a, an incredibly hopeful message and uh, hopefully attracting talent and then okay. inspiring people. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. I'd, I'd like to, to start wrapping up, but um, wanted to get to the, uh, the kind of final question that we ask all our guests, which is really the, the recommendation of, of another guest to be on the podcast. And it can be absolutely anybody. It can be somebody you know personally or somebody, as long as you think it would be relevant to our audience, which is you know, the event and the meetings industry, then the, that would be great. Yeah, so I I'm, I'm was prepared for this one. Um, so, so much of the, I think... What has blown my my brain and heart open through this XI work is hearing diverse perspectives. And um, some of the, the speakers that um, we've had the pleasure of hearing from are from the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. Um, so Dr. Lonnie Brooks and Ahmed Best, who's actually an actor, he was in Star Wars, they lead this effort called Afro Rhythms from the Future and a lot of their work is about envisioning an alternative future that is completely flipped the script from today. Um, so imagine that in the future, um, people who are marginalized communities today are actually um, the leaders in the future, right? So they do a lot of this episodic futures thinking that help you completely bust out of current models. And I think our industry could use that so, so much. Um, there's also uh, a book called Imaginable written by Jane McGonigal. She's also out of Institute from the Future. I just think you'd really love all these people. And um, I, I like to share brilliance. So I encourage everyone to check them out. Sounds great. It sounds like it, sounds like it would be a great uh, opportunity to have some uh, excellent movie scripts kind of developed, <laughs> you know, with a small focus group. For... That too. <laughs> 
Uh, Megan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you about these topics. I wish you a great uh, IMAX show. I know you're busy. You have a lot of presentations to do, and you're going to be joining us at the Innovation Lab. So I hope you have a great week, and thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you so much. This has been a really fun conversation. Thank you.